So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the next in our series on the Royal Society of Medicine in Conversation. And um, I want to thank you very much for your support for this. Uh, the proceedings will be going to supporting what's our mission anyway, for supporting health professionals um, uh, across the UK, uh, but never was it more important than it is today. So where are we today? Well, today my guest is the writer and journalist, Evan Davis. And uh, Evan is a well-known figure to all of us, um, had a partly traditional background, you might say, that's shorthand for saying he did PPE at Oxford. And in a sign of things to come, he edited Churwell, the uh, student newspaper. But he moved into a very successful career in economics um, in Harvard, uh, Institute of Fiscal Studies, London Business School, before finally returning to journalism as the economic correspondent for the BBC, and took over indeed as editor from Peter Jay. Better known to many of us perhaps then as moving to the Sauté programme for many years, took over from Jeremy Paxman at Newsnight, and more recently the PM programme where he was this evening. But I'm very pleased to say he's agreed to forego his food and drink at home and talk to us first. Now then, Evan, it's not any old drink that you delayed for us because actually checking your Wiki Wikipedia's page, I noticed something rather special that today's actually your birthday. So, <laughs> It Happy is. Birthday, and I, Evan. Yes. Oh, we do our research, you know. We do our research. I had completely forgotten that when I agreed to do this because all the days <laughs> seem the same at the moment when you're working and sitting at home all day. So, um, but it's an absolute privilege to be with you, and uh, I can't think of any better way to spend a birthday than in conversation <laughs> with Professor. <laughs> that was. I almost <laughs> believed you. Okay. <laughs> so, Evan, let, let's. I, I, I always like to start off some of these conversations. I want to see first of all where you are on what is the kind of the question around COVID that divides uh, society, politicians, journalists, policymakers, and presidents alone, which is this one. Are we actually at war or aren't we? Look, I, I, I know why you're asking that. I, um, I sometimes think we jump to the war metaphor too quickly. And I sometimes think we look to the First World War and the Second World War as the only things that are kind of our moments of national glory and our moments of building a national identity. It's uh, a lot of us are brought up on war films and I think we do perhaps overemphasize war in our history. But I think the war metaphor gets us quite a long way on this one in terms of just how drastic uh, a project this is. And I was talking about the economic, the economic background, which happens to be my, my, uh, my background, but of course, the, uh, the challenge of dealing with the disease itself. I mean, the big difference, of course, Simon, is normally when there's war, there's an enemy. There are other human beings who you're against. And at least in this one, we're all on the same side. Um, but I, th I think as a kind of way of getting across the scales, I think the war metaphor is good. And I'll just give you one example of that. Mm -hmm. Some economists at the beginning of this were writing, well, maybe it'll cause a recession or maybe, you know, the economy will shrink by 2% or something. And it's like, guys, 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 no, this is, this is going to have a much bigger economic effect than that. You're kind of stuck in a, in a business as usual mindset and a sort of a bad day in business as usual. And this is much, much bigger. So I, um, I think probably, I think the war metaphor may be helpful to people. So I'm, I'm happy for that to, uh, happy okay. for that to be used. I mean, the queen did it very well, didn't she? By at least the, when she said, uh, we'll meet again, we all knew what she meant and the way that had come from. That's probably the most subtle use of the war metaphor I've uh, witnessed yet. Now I need to, I forgot to remind people that we are doing Q and A. So use the Q and A function um, and I will see your questions. Although the very first question is actually said, is this your birthday? So we've already answered that question perfectly. <laughs> that one we've done. <laughs> yes, okay. So recession, there doesn't seem to be anyone who doesn't think that this is what's happening. Um, worse than 2008? Better? Yeah, I think, I think, it's, it's, I think the, the difference was this, is in 2008, it was an economic event that occurred because a lot of economic imbalances had accumulated and the economic event, the, 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 the great shock, the financial crash, that was a response to economic imbalances. So, it was, if you like, it was actually changing the economic trajectory of the country. Um, and in a way, the 2008 experience was telling us that what we had been doing was unsustainable. It was kind of all these imbalances have built up. This one, I think, is really different. I don't think the economic picture was unsustainable. 
Um, this one is just much more a shock to our economy. Uh, it's kind of like a, a, from out of outer space, a shock that hits the economy. But I think the short term effect will be even bigger than the, the crash. I just think we are effectively shutting down, I don't know, let's call it half the economy for a short period of the year, you know, and it could be could be a month, um, could be six weeks, but that's a very, very significant, a very significant shock. So in my head, on the kind of annual growth figures, we normally think of ourselves as growing at one or two percent a year. A bad year is we shrink by one or two percent. And I the crash we shrank by five or six percent in one year. And I would be thinking more like a kind of a 10% shock. But, but these are all totally ballpark figures. We have no idea. But I just, feel, I just feel the scale of this is much bigger. You know, I mean, I just go outside and I see activity is at a, a, at a fifth of what it was. And, and that's really- I mean, I'm surprised you, you say that you think we're shutting this down for a month or six weeks. Most of us, you know, on the medical side are anticipating this being a lot longer than that. Or are you just thinking we just can't do that? Well, no, no, I think we can. I think we can, um, and, and we well might. But I, I'm just taking as a minimum uh, okay. a month. Um, no, and if it's if it's longer than that, we we, we could see a forty percent reduction in GDP this year. I mean, that, let's be honest. In in, in the war, uh, we had to redivert half the economy to the war efforts. I mean, that that human beings are capable of that kind of massive adjustment to big shocks. I mean, as it happens, I think there will be, um, you know, there will be an argument about how far we keep keep the lid on it and how far we we mm. release. And I guess that isn't going to be a conversation only we're going to have. Every country is going to be having that, and we will look at what happens when other places do. You know, we already see other countries are well ahead of us in thinking about easing the lockdown, and we'll see how much activity can continue. But I mean, this is, yeah, I, I feel this is a very big economic event, but we should be able to come out of it if the economy doesn't get destroyed by it. We should be able to come out of it um, and, you, you, you know, rebuild very quickly as we did after the, as we do after wars regularly. Well, certainly some, some of your ex-colleagues, I suppose you have to call them in, in economics. I mean, I, I caught um, the deputy head of the World Bank, the wonderful Axel von Rustenberg, Sounds like one of the conspirators against Hitler, doesn't he? Um, anyway, we saw he was talking and uh, he took a fairly gloomy view on this and, and said actually that the mechanisms of world trade themselves were going to be affected and this would impede you know, an early bounce back. And can you explain what he meant by the mechanisms of world trade? Okay, well, I mean, so, the, so there are so many dimensions to this. So let's <laughs> okay. just take the trade Briefly. one first. Yeah. The okay. trade one first. Mm. Um, supply chains are being disrupted. Global supply chains are being disrupted. Uh, companies don't want to, um, companies can't do business cross as much cross-border business. They can't buy the stuff they're used to buying. And a lot of that, I imagine, will take time to be rebuilt. And I think there will be a huge effort by companies to bring supply chains back home to some extent because they have now been alerted to just how, you know, they've been alerted to how fragile these supply chains are if anything goes wrong. So I think there will be deglobalization in that respect. Mm. Um, and that, that is an adjustment and that will be costly. I'm much more concerned about this one, which is we have these vehicles that deliver most of our economic activity, not all of it, but most of it. They are called companies. And a company is a really interesting thing. It's a, it's a sort of fragile construct, human construct. And if you, if you make the company insolvent and destroy it over the course of the next three months, it takes a heck of a long time to bring it back, you know. And so just let's take an airline. What is an airline? An airline is a lot of planes, a lot of pilots with contracts with the airline and lots of other staff ground staff, a computer system, a reputation and a brand, and a network of other contracts with caterers and with airports and with a timetable and with air traffic control. Now, if you destroy the airline over the course of the next three months, so that whole nexus of contracts is dismantled, you've still got the pilots, you've still got the planes and the airports and the air traffic control, but just the job of rebuilding 
of rebuilding that construct of the company is absolutely huge. And so the, the, by far the biggest challenge of this for me is how do you keep something like an airline in, or in, in existence so that it is there when we come out of this to start flying people again? Um, I, because a lot of those airlines, they'll say, well, we have no income, we can't operate. Well, okay, you ground the planes. But the losses will just basically wipe out the entire value of the airline. So what we don't want is for the airline to dismantle itself, to be liquidated. We don't want the airline, we, we, we somehow need the airline to carry on existing in a frozen state until we come out of this. And we don't know how to keep companies in, in, in the deep freeze. And we don't know how we're going to, to kind of give them a new birth. And just as an example, if the government says to a company like Virgin, here's half a billion quid to carry yeah. on existing, um, if, if the government does that for Virgin, does the government then own a quarter of Virgin? Or does the government say you can have it as a gift to the shareholders of Virgin? Or does the government say, hey, look, there's a whole lot of stuff we want you to do differently in future if you're going to be an airline receiving our money? I mean, these are all enormous questions. And they're going to have to, be, I think, be answered in quite, you know, double quick time, really, um, is how we keep these things called companies in existence. Because we can't, I think, afford to throw them all away, because then the challenge of rebuilding is absolutely enormous. I mean, there, there'll be some, I'm checking it, but I'm sure there'll be some people saying there's obviously a good side to that, because we're already seeing positive effects on climate change but yeah, no, well uh, i was just taking an airline as a as yeah a, i know but but, but that but you could go with a catering company with a restaurant yeah. with a with a you know with any yeah. number of, 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 of with manufacturing companies all over the place companies are just hemorrhaging cash and they will res mm. they have the resilience for a week or a month or maybe two months but not all of them will have resilience no and um your namesake well not quite namesake william davis was prophesying this is finally the end of the high streets is that going too far or? Well, no, I, th I think it's not going to. I mean, so any business trend that was already in operation and has been accentuated by this, I think you would say gets accelerated, doesn't it? So newspapers suffering terribly from advertising shortfalls, they're really putting staff on pay cuts or furloughing some staff. It's, it's, it's painful, really painful. Um, one imagines that, you know, given that the, the pace of, if you like, decline in the physical newspaper product over the last five years, one imagines that gets accelerated. And the same with the high street, that, that it will precipitate some of the change that was underway anyway. Because if you imagine a shop that was clinging on three months ago and mm. has been, you know, wiped out by this, maybe rescued by some government package, there's going to be a lot of are we really going to stay in business you know are we going to try and salvage this after this or are we just going to let it let it go and i i imagine there will be a bit of that so i think it's really yeah, to ask. yeah. people are asking that the figures that you're quoting take us into great depression territory yeah and of yeah, course totally. okay you're not disputing yeah. that at all no no, no 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 i mean no. I think we, we don't know how long this is going to be but it's it's really significant and it's 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 a very big shock. mention of the mention of the great depression brings out slightly you know my my, my wished for profession was his history before the great depression came the great inflation and so that raises the question of what we've already done which is unprecedented and extraordinary i mean the chances was it 7.5 percent of the our gdp he promised in less than seven days in office i mean that <laughs> is just yeah. eye-blowing yeah but come on like, Where's that going to come from? Right. So there's nothing in this crisis other than that we have to look after ourselves. And if the government borrows money, um, that is just basically, it's a lot of people giving the government money and the government saying we'll give it back to you in the future. So all, all we are really doing is making obligations and promises to ourselves, from ourselves to keep us going. There's no way out of this. We are going to pay for it. There are a variety of different ways we can pay for it, and we can distribute the burden in different ways. But I think the most likely two ways are that we will have some inflation at the end of this, because we might print some money to pay for it. And 
I don't think it looks like there's much inflation now because it's not like consumers can spend money now. They're at home and they can't go and buy a car and they can't buy a holiday. So can't buy homes. You're right. That's gone. Yeah. So, so I don't think inflation looks like a problem now. It may be that you get inflation at the end of this. Um, I, Jim O'Neill, pretty good economist, from former Goldman Sachs uh, in the House of Lords now, he said that would be quite a nice problem to have at this point. So we may get some inflation. Inflation is just a way of making us all a little bit poorer. And that's one way of paying for it. And then the other more obvious way of paying for it is tax. You know, we'll just put up taxes and that's just saying, hey folks, we had to, you know, take money from some people via borrowing. Uh, that's just a way in which people who lend money to the government, you know, give up something. We now need to give it back to them or we need to give money to people who've been wiped out by the, by the crisis. And so tax, those are the two obvious ways we pay for it. There aren't that many other ways to pay for a crisis other than to, you know, to- And this is, this is the quantitative easing, I think. Is that the word you use? Or? Well, I mean, I think that the quantitative easing is where the Bank of England buys government bonds. So these are government IOUs. The Bank of England right. goes out and says to someone like a pension fund or a bank, hey, you've got some of these government IOUs. We'll give you my cash and you give us those IOUs. I think what we might end up with, and there's a debate about this, is the Bank of England just lending the money directly to the government. And it, this is, it's, it's, one, it's, it's like quantitative easing right into the vein. I mean, it is a totally, it's a real pure money printing operation. Because the Bank of England, when it lends money, just prints it to lend it. It doesn't have the money to lend to the government in any other way. So I think we might get some of that if the government starts struggling to borrow the money the bank of england will lend the money that is the weimar zimbabwe route but i don't think they will do it on a scale that is going to lead to hyperinflation i think they will do it much more carefully they will decide how much they do and they will control it so we're not going to head to hyperinflation but we might head to a little more than the two percent inflation we also well, in love in the last few years at one point during the hyperinflation in germany germany um, a, a sheet of toilet paper was worth more than I think it was a million mark note. So at least we'll all be well prepared for that. And that happens. <laughs> anyway, the note's all being plastic now. It's uh, it's probably not so. so. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I um, but I we're not. I don't think. I, you know, we're not. I, I would be very surprised if the Bank of England ever allowed it to go far enough to have a huge dose of inflation, mm. but more than the kind of inflation we've been used to. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised. You know. And, but, and tell us more then a little bit about, again, it's been asked here, about um, what, in, in this business of the supply chain. We've had problems with the supply chain in various areas that we've suddenly noticed. And the tendency, surely, is to regroup. And you know, the Germans seem to have done this better um, in certain you know, pharmaceutical areas uh, uh, um, uh, in, the, in the life science sector. Um, do you think there will now be a general tendency to bring everything, as we say, into the, into the home or into the country and not rely on global trade. Right, not, I not think there's a tendency to that. Okay. I don't think we will see the complete reversal. But again, this comes into the category, which I've already mentioned, of things that might have been happening anyway. So what okay. has happened in the last few years is that a lot, a lot of companies have discovered China isn't as cheap as it used to be. You know, broadly speaking, onshoring has been beginning to happen because actually Chinese workers have just got a lot richer they're paid much better and they've got a lot more choices uh, mm. as the country has developed and so a lot of Western companies begin to think do we really want to have a six-week you know shipping issue uh, for, for, for what is becoming a more modest cost saving so I think yeah I think you might see a little bit more you might see a little bit more onshoring. And I think that's just one of those things that will be accelerated. We, we, we're living in a kind of slightly protectionist era. Obviously the US president is very much into his, his protection. We're getting more trade barriers between the UK and the, 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 the European Union as a result of Brexit. So that also perhaps encourages a bit of onshoring. Um, but I, I think this was a trend that was already being discussed, already being talked about before COVID. And all COVID has done is broken some of the links so that decisions about where you rebuild them will accelerate the process that was already underway. So, you know, yeah, I, I, I go with the idea that this is a spur to deglobalization in the global economy. 
and then a kind of another principle of, of what you might call the, the, you know, the orthodox economics of the last few years, of the last decades that we have already challenged in this country, is also the free movement of labour. Now, what's happened after pandemics before in history, there's been a major suppression of that through the equation of immigration with a pandemic. And that goes back a long, long way. The, um, the cholera riots in Liverpool in 1848 um, were exactly about that. So the Irish coming over to work, but were blamed for cholera, many of them were sent back. And that's the beginning of anti-Irish feeling in this country comes from that and it lasted for the next hundred years. So is it inevitable that we will see, you know, that this will, and, and you listen to Trump talking, that, you know, when he talks about the Chinese virus, he almost sounds like Fu Manchu. He actually really does. It's quite extraordinary. So the xenophobia is, will rise. And do you think that will lead to even further tightening of immigration at a time when you might think that we would, might need it more? Really, really interesting one that Simon actually your little history lesson there is actually oh wow <laughs> new to me so um no thank you for that no look I um it did it, there, there were episodes of anti-Asian feeling in, in in Britain at the beginning of this and there was a bit of a backlash I I I'm less worried about that because it is such a pandemic that I think pinning it down on any kind of person or color of skin mm. as a carrier I think it's going to be is going to look faintly ridiculous by the end of it um it you know you'd be stupid to say there's an Asian person I better cross the street to get away because really we know it's it's affecting all of us so I I mean I tend to trust in human rationality so I wouldn't have thought that but I would have thought there is there are some effects I think I mean, we've already obviously stopping free movement in this country. Yeah. The area which I think may very much be affected are overseas students. I think this will have been a shock to the Chinese higher education customer. Mm. Um, so I think there's a sort of interesting question about whether parents in China will want to just dispatch their kids off to foreign countries in the same way I, I, I don't know. So I think there are, I think there are lots of issues here. Mm. Um, I thought of that one. Yeah. Hasn't it? it has been interesting, Simon, how I think, and I know one or two cases of this, of people who are resident abroad, but not seeing themselves as foreign, but who kind of feel this is a moment that you come back home. I mean, it's just yeah. you know, in Italy, but actually, I, I think this is the time to be back in, in, in the UK. And I think that's a sort of a strange thing, really. We've been so comfortable with. And presumably feeling that is also, it looks as if, um, you know, on the surface that uh, Asia, um, such as China, Taiwan, Singapore, etc., have appeared to be managing this better than us. I mean, there's reasons we can dispute some bits of that, but, but certainly, and America, its reputation, I think someone else said for, for Comp at least disregarding Trump, its reputation for competence in managing these things has suffered massively. Um, and do you think that that will then have an effect as well, that there'll be a further shift of power towards these, because you know, they're even managing public health emergencies better than we are. You're safer at home. I mean, there might be that. I mean, I think it is very, very interesting to look and ask who is doing best and who's doing worse. Yeah. Now, my, my own opinion, by the way, as a journalist on this, is remain open-minded, and let's judge this at the end or towards the end rather yeah. than midway through. So I'm not with those who are um, desperate to kind of say, oh my God, our numbers are worse than so-and-so or our numbers are worse. It's kind of like, for a start, the numbers are all kind of rather provisional at the moment. Let's mm. all just wait and reflect and judge this at the end. But this pandemic, more than any global experience, probably in my lifetime, is going to allow us a degree of system comparison. And we're going to say, my goodness, they did really well, didn't they? Or they did well because they didn't care about privacy. They went straight to an app that tracked you wherever you were. And yet we kind of bang on about, you know, I don't want anyone to have the data. Or they did well because they're not a democracy. And all these questions will be asked at the end. I just, I just would like us to wait to the end before asking those and I would also say 
that you have to take everything into account. So some people saying China have handled it very well. But in the Chinese experience, when the history is written, we will have to ask, did they engage in what we know happens in authoritarian society sometime, sometimes, of trying to deny it rather than deal with it in the early days? And so all of yeah. this is way too early to write the history. We should be keeping notes and we should be asking questions and we should be thinking hard, but we shouldn't be jumping to conclusions yet. But I do, I do really agree. I mean, a really interesting one where I think there was some European, a little bit of European sneering was on the wearing of face masks, where it was like, mm -hmm. don't these Asians know it doesn't matter, it doesn't make any difference. We've got our health experts who tell us it doesn't make any difference. And actually, the science seems to have changed in the last couple of weeks, and more or less, I think now the advice is, it is better to have face masks as a, as a culture. And, you know, I don't again, think it's quite gone that far, Evan. Say again? <laughs> it's quite that much, no, not quite. <laughs> But it's changed a bit, you're right. Yeah. Um, and so we might, we might come to respect those societies more as places that have learned lessons and dealt with them. Of course. I think that's a fair point. On the other hand, I will tell you one thing, Simon. I promise you this, or I, I make you this bet. <laughs> if we have a pandemic again within 15 years, we will deal with it much better next time than we dealt with this one. I mean, that one I we will learn lessons from this, you know. I think that's true. And I, and I think one of the, the start of this, people, a lot of people, and then the polling was showing this, was saying you cried wolf over swine flu and this is like that. Whereas in other countries that actually had a big problem with SARS, they were quicker to react because the population didn't think they were crying wolf. Yeah. I don't and think I think that, I think that's, I don't think that's a criticism actually. I think it's just simply an observation. We're, we're human beings, you know. Yeah. So I mean, let's, I mean, let's try and look on the bright side, if we possibly can. A lot of people have been saying there's some good things coming out of this. Alan Rusbridger, I'm sure you know, said that, uh, and I quote from this, he said, what this will show is there is such a thing as society and we are all interdependent. And, and the chief rabbi said, you know, after collective danger comes greater solidarity, we will all be renewed by this crisis. Is that utopian nonsense or no. is that actually no. a vision? No, I think, it, I think that's all true. I think it has a kind of half-life, doesn't it? After Diana died, we all thought we were a kind of a new nation of more giving, yes. less selfish people. And, you know, John it, Smith it, it, as well, even. Yep. For, a few, for a few days. That, 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 but I think this will have that effect. I think, you know, just looking around the neighbourhood, I think contacts are made, support networks are built, and I don't think they will disestablish. But I think, I think for me, I think the good thing that comes out of this is I think we'll be more ambitious about how we deal with problems. I mean, because we've just seen how much better we are than we thought we were at just getting some things done, that's not to say they've been perfect or not to say they've been, you know, that it, 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 it's been brilliant, but I did not believe we could put together a kind of 500 bed hospital in, a, in, 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 in 10 days. I just, it wouldn't have occurred to me that we had the kind of logistical, organizational capability to do that. And yet we did it. Um, I wouldn't have believed that the economic package, the chancellor, had, if you'd asked me before this, I would never have believed that the economic package could have been delivered that quickly. We've done yeah. it. Now, here's one. Okay, so here's an example, right? This is the one I keep thinking about. Rough sleeping. It has been a, for a decade, it has been a, a growing, gnawing problem at our social fabric, stepping over people on pavements, seeing them sleeping in doorways. It's horrific. Mm -hmm. No one likes it. For some reason, nothing has been done. It has seemed insoluble. People have said we can deal with it, but it never is dealt with. And then in the course of a week, every local authority is told, get the rough sleepers off the streets. We can't have them on the streets in this lockdown. They're all put in hotels. They've all been accommodated. And what is going to happen at the end of this? Are we going to say, hey, the good times are back, guys. Now get back out on the streets and sleep in a doorway. <laughs> I can't believe that's going to happen. I think we'll say, you know what? We should have dealt with it and we can deal with it. And that we're just going to deal with it. We're not going to sort of, we're not going, we're not going to accept, oh, we can't do anything as an answer. So I think, yep. I think it's ambition that is the thing that might be born out so, of this. Social care. Come on, Simon. How long have we been arguing about social care? It's just, it's, if I had hair, I would be tearing it out. 
having to report on arguments and reforms and commissions and investigations into social care. Yeah. And then suddenly the Chancellor's just bunged money into social care because we have to. Um, and I, 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 I sort of see us resolving some of those things and saying we can't, we can't just argue about stuff. And sometimes it's got to do it. And I think that <laughs> so would be when, um, when Michael Gove said, you know, we have to put the lives of the vulnerable ahead of everything else, we, we'll hold him to that. <laughs> well, we'll see. I, I mean, I think when it comes to lives, I think, yes, I think we okay. will. And I, I think, you know, I mean, I think it's been so interesting to see ideology just chucked out the window straight away. I mean, I think basically people have yeah. all become pragmatists. It's all, that we, let's just see what works, you know, and, and it's all about the immediate, immediate effect. It's not about, you know, trying to find something that fits a template. So that's, that's all good. And, I, and I, I, you know, I think it'll just be really interesting seeing how we deal with problems and whether we just become a little bit more can do over the next few years. I think that, that'll be, you know, that will, that will be a reason. Let's talk about one particular employer, your employer, for example, the BBC. And uh, Anna Waring is saying uh, how what a good job you've done. They're generally saying that, and how much uh, information, you know, how much people value the information that mention you personally, but others as well. Um, if we go back to the war analogy, is it true the BBC is having a good war? Um, I like to think the BBC has stepped up. Actually, I like to think it. Um, it's done the job. I think Tony Hall has led it rather well in the past few weeks at a really difficult time in terms of the BBC has its own staff problems, its own sickness, its own people working from home. And it has kept the show on the road very well. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the big night in event of April the 23rd, a big charity event, um, I think is a really inspired idea putting a load of stuff onto the iPod, onto the iPlayer so people can have stuff to watch at home. I, I like to think the BBC has really given good service. I think we at the BBC, I mean, I've lived through the financial crash, which is a big national experience. I, think, I like to think we, we take our responsibility very seriously as a national broadcaster at big national moments. And I, I think we have, I mean, it's for, the, the, it's for others to judge whether we've had a good war. But I, 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 all I can say is people have made a real effort and people mm. at the BBC have taken very seriously that they should have a good war, that they are there. There's a lot of rubbish being spoken. We don't want to regurgitate that. There's a lot of connecting to go on at the moment between it, within communities and between communities. And we have a job to do in that. And so I think, you know, you go from everything from local radio to news on radio, to entertainment, and to the kind of the bigger corporate decisions that have been made about delaying the, 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 the license yeah. features for older people. I think all of that has been, I think has been to the scale Maybe. of the challenge the country's having. So I hope, I mean, you know, I hope, I hope the country feels the same. You but think I mean, that there's everyone's a, making huge efforts at a time when we're ourselves- You think there's been a kiss and make up with the government? I noticed the, your old, flagship today program all of a sudden ministers are keen to come on all of a sudden do you think that will be a rapprochement all, all history we, we don't need to go over past arguments and i have to say <laughs> Unak today saying the government will match whatever's raised on that bbc big night in thing on april 23rd was a very nice gesture so if ever there was a war between us and the government and i i don't see it that way we are just agents we just you know we just do our business and government's you know, they choose whether they want to come on or not come on. That's entirely their decision. But I thought Rishi, Su if ever there was a war, Rishi Sunak saying they would, the government will match whatever the BBC raises. I thought was okay. a very nice touch. And you have a career as a diplomat, I'm sure. <laughs> your third career after this. Um, but tell us, I mean, come on, tell us, I mean, you're among friends now, but, you, but they, this audience are doctors. And one of the things that we do like, I, I'm fascinated by, is how people do their jobs. And, you know, people love watching our doctors do their jobs. We'd love to hear a bit more about how journalists do your job. So I've been into the Today Studio quite a few times. And sometimes yeah. it's like being in a kind of high pressure operating theatre with rather, you know, high pressure surgeons throwing things at each other. What, what's it like there? Well, you know, 
most of what our job is like is sitting in front of a computer for the, <laughs> the day or for the morning. And then, then you go into the studio, which is a sort of relatively small proportion of the actual operation. Um, and it is broadly speaking, as it is in your world, Simon, a lot of lower paid people serving and delivering to the, to the better paid people um, the material that makes the whole thing work. And we are incredibly dependent on them. They're the brightest star, the researchers, the producers, and, and, and you know, they, they fix the guests. I, I write my cues, I think about the interviews, I read into the topics. Um, I'm broadcasting from home on, uh, during this Indeed. crisis, but when I'm not at that, that crisis, I, am, I go into the studio and I'm as good as the team, and uh, often not as good as the team. And um, so they, they really keep the show on the road. And, and the, there's the technical team who are kind of taking in lines and feeding things to us. But broadly speaking, it's, we've, we've done it so many times, you know, it's a very smooth operation. We're all very used to it. Um, everybody knows their little part in the great machine and everybody just does it. And there are some people who have a reputation of having fairly larger egos than others, haven't they? Like oh my God, well, yes. I mean, I work in a world of uh, very big egos. I, 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 I like to think of myself as low maintenance and not, not one of those. Um, yes, I've, I've, I've worked with John Humphreys. I've, I've obviously, the dragons on Dragon's Den. Uh, no, there are, there are big egos. My, my experience of big egos is they're, they're often quite effective people. Um, they're kind of a combination of needy and, and supreme self-confidence and extreme neediness. Like um, doctors then. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 but lovely people. No, but honestly, um, there are, I, I mean, you know, Dragon's Den is, it, 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 you don't become a dragon without a little bit of ego. Um, I used to, in the, in the early days of Dragon's Den, I would interview all the entrepreneurs who came through the, um, through the door. And in the early days, when the dragons were more feeling their way with it, there was quite a lot of tension between those big egos. And, you know, I can remember doing my little post encounter interview with one of the entrepreneurs <laughs> who, as yeah. it happens, had just been, had just gotten investment. And I was talking to her. And I could hear two dragons <laughs> shouting at each other in a most vicious argument in the background. Um, and I was like, smiling, smiling, trying to talk a little bit louder so that she couldn't hear the dragons uh, tearing each other apart. But you know, big egos often make for effective people. I, I, I don't have a, I think a big ego myself, but no, I've worked with a lot of big egos. Yeah, you know, um, and, uh, I think in any in any office you need a few big egos, but you don't want everyone to be a big ego. And uh, we're moving towards the end now. But uh, looking back on on Newsnight or the Today program, what has been some of your couple of your favourite moments? Then most enjoyed, either yourself yeah, um, or witnessing or whatever. Well, I mean, I, there are the guests who you like to interview, and my, yeah. so my my highlight career highlight was was Warren Buffett, one of the richest people in the world, by the you know one of the 10 richest, the world's best investor, lovely guy, properly richer than any blood, bloody oligarch and all of that, and just drives an ordinary car and lives in an ordinary, nice big suburban house in Omaha, Nebraska, and who, um, who just spent, you know, gave us loads of time and let us just wander around his office with a camera filming, absolutely no, no PR people, no constraints, no telling us what we could ask. It was just absolute delight, a really lovely guy. I asked him, because he gives all his money, he gives loads of his money to, to philanthropic causes, um, his billions and billions. And I said, it's amazing there are no buildings, no buildings named after you or anything. And he said, no, no, well, I'm gonna give them money anyway. They, they really are much better. <laughs> reserving the naming rights to someone who really wants the naming rights and then they get the money. But I, I'm just going to give them the money unconditioned. So he's a lovely guy. So he's, he's probably my nicest interviewee. I mean, probably the most, um, one, of the, one of the most interesting moments was, so this might, uh, this one applies to the medical world because it, it, it's a Jeremy Hunt story, is that I was presenting the Today program the day that James Nocte got confused over the name <laughs> Jeremy Hunt and mispronounced it. And it was actually, I wasn't in the studio at the time because often you come whipping out of the studio. 
to do a quick little interview, record something while, while the other one is holding the fort in the studio. So I'd left and I came out of my little workshop studio where I'd recorded something and the editor yep. ran up to me and said, you won't believe what's happened. Um, Jim just referred to Jeremy Hunt as, you know, the culture secretary. <laughs> the, yeah, no, um, we, we remember. <laughs> and, and I said, do you think anyone noticed? <laughs> and, and um, you know, Kerry, the editor said, I think a lot of people will have noticed. <laughs> and, and he, <laughs> anyway, we went in and I then had to interview Jeremy Hunt. And I was like, I think we should just, the show must go on. We don't say anything about it. Yeah. But, you know, it, I, I'm sure, I'm sure it wasn't a big deal. And then with, you know, I just looked at Twitter and James Nocty and Jeremy Hunt were the top trends in global Twitter. <laughs> and we were like, we realized, I think people did notice. I think they really I think did. they did. I think they did. Okay. Yeah. Well, look, Jeremy I Hunt, think... by the way, was a really good sport about that. Honestly, he's always been a good sport about it. And there's... And I think it was more understandable because he was, re Jim was reading a page, Jeremy Hunt, culture secretary. I think it would have been hard a mistake to make when Jeremy Hunt went on to the, uh, the greater job of health secretary. But um, yeah, you know, he's always been a very good sport about it. <laughs> okay. I'm not entirely sure if that's the, a high point to end on or a low point, <laughs> but it's certainly a point to end on, I'll grant you that. And of course, um, I should say, Jeremy Hunt will be joining us in this series. <laughs> and um, I'm sure he'll be delighted that we will be able to go back over his finest hour. Um, good. So I think we, we need to bring things to a close, partly so you can celebrate your birthday. Um, well done. And uh, thank you very, very much for doing that. That's as good as it gets, Simon. It's quite <laughs> nice in. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, we're going to have and, a nice uh, day. Can I just remind the audience that uh, to follow now the... the hashtag that I've now completely lost, but it's uh, RSM Live. Yes, to follow the hashtag RSM Live, which will tell you about um, all our various events that we're doing. Um, tomorrow, we'll be doing our lunchtime slot um, with, um, with our dog just running out there, as that's what you just heard. Um, not with the dog, but with uh, Professor Hugh Montgomery talking about intensive care and critical care. Couldn't be more topical. That's very topical. And uh, we'll be continuing also, that, that conversation is next week. And then in the longer version that we have at seven o'clock, the in conversation that you just so nobly filled, I'll be talking to Fergal Keane, um, a different kind of journalist to you, I think. Um, the, uh, today program may be austere, but he really goes to real war zones. And then next week, he'll be the historian, Andrew Roberts. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. First of all, thank you so much, Evan, for, for uh, Great pleasure. taking thank you, time. Sir. Thank you for those who've been watching. In fact, we got through a lot of your questions, actually. Sometimes, often, Evan, you pick them up as if by magic. I suppose you're a professional. And um, so, once again, thank you very much. Good night from us. And uh, we'll see you hopefully tomorrow at lunchtime and this time again next week. Thank Good you, night Sam. from the Royal Society Med. Thank you. Goodbye.